<laughs> All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the last lecture of the quarter. Um, we're gonna do like random miscellaneous neural networks topics right now. Um, and we're gonna go a layer deeper in neural networks. But first, oh, fill this up. Okay, that's right, we started really late. But hopefully everyone's filled it out and we'll be seeing some new characters. Um, okay, also we're gonna be doing a inter-engineering club, uh, inter-engineering club Frisbee tournament on March 4th from 2 to 5 in the IM Fields. So you should show up, Cynthia's organizing it. It's gonna be really fun. Um, yes, scan QR code, do the tiny URL, or just show up. This is mostly to gauge who's interested, and also like maybe send people updates on what's happening. We're about to let Cameron's hair look like that. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, do that. I also can't help but notice no one's taking their phones out to, you know, scan the QR code, so I'm gonna wait for a little, little bit. Is it on the Discord as well? Yes. Uh, That's why. I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, I already, I already oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Also, if, if uh, Jackie's watching, uh, I know you play Frisbee, so you better show up and play with us so we can assess this time. Okay, uh, also, if you are looking for a date, well, we can't help you, but you can go to IEEE Officer Speed Dating, and if you want to learn more about different officer positions, uh, then yeah, come by and you can talk to us if you want to see about being pocket racers lead or just something else, I don't know, events, whatever. Come by, talk to us. Even if you don't care, just come by anyway. It'll be fun. That's going to be March 3rd. Okay. Um, details undecided. <laughs> yeah. But it'll be fine on March 3rd. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So we're going to talk about uh, overfitting. Uh, we talked a little bit about overfitting before, but basically neural networks, uh, what we talked about last time, um, they're very good at like representing very complicated functions, uh, and they can really easily just basically learn um, the data that you give them to train with. So we're going to talk about how we can, instead of learning our training data, we can learn about like the actual larger feature space as a whole. Um, ooh, look how overfit this is. All right. Now, uh, so we're going to first talk about ridge regression, and this is um, just the, all right, so, um, right, overfitting, this is overfitting, we just talked about that. Um, but when you look at this model, right, this is going to be a polynomial model, uh, or a polynomial uh, regression, um, and the weights are going to be really high for this, right, we're gonna, to make it look, look like this. Um, so, what we're going to try and do in order to counteract this is we're going to penalize our model for having really large weights. Um, so if the weights get too large, uh, we're going to want to uh, make that increase our loss. And this is really easy. We're just going to sum up all of our weights at the very end, and we are going and we add this to our loss term. Um, so if this is taking the sum of the squares of all of our weights. So as our weights get larger, the loss is also going to increase. And then we just take the gradient of this loss function and do regular gradient descent. I mean, this is a very easy term to take the gradient of, right? You just move the two out front, um, and you're good. Um, <clears throat> lambda right here is the uh, regularization parameter. So this is basically saying, how much do we care that our weights are big? So if our weights are really big and lambda is really high, then it's going to penalize us a lot. But if we like just want like a smaller lambda, uh, and we are going to let our model overfit a little bit more, then, um, then we can do that. And if lambda is like really large, right, all the weights are just going to go to zero or very close to zero because it's going to um, it's going to dominate this term. Um, see, this is a L two regularization. Um, there's also L one and L infinity regularization, which are different formulas. I don't think we have these on the slides, um, but just so you know. Um, L1 is instead of summing the square of all the terms, uh, you just sum the absolute values of all the terms. And um, L infinity is you just take the largest term. And that is what you add. Um, so you might see those later. Anyway, so this is an example. Um, <laughs> we, have, we have two uh, polynomial regression models. Uh, both of them are trying to fit the data. Um, and both of them have an overly complex feature space, which basically means um, we're trying to learn, uh, learn from the model um, with 
uh, polynomial uh, with a polynomial that is a much higher degree than the than the uh, data was generated with. Um, and basically, you can just see the effect of regression here. Um, there's a slide that we're not going to show that has all the code for this. If you kind of if you're curious, but um, yeah, so I mean, basically, if you're using this blue model and you wanted to try and estimate what point happens right here, you guess this, and that that that's no good. So regularization, really good stuff. All right, now we're going to talk about dropout because what we've been talking about so far, regularization, it has um, implications in machine learning as a whole, and it's used in a lot of places. But as far as neural networks go, there's other techniques we have to fix uh, overfitting. So first of all, we need to establish that model complexity isn't always a good thing. When a model is too complex, as we saw earlier, like if your polynomial has too many degrees for a given data set, then what happens is the, um, your model is more likely to learn the little itty bitty bits of noise that are just like present in the data set and not really focus on the bigger picture. And this is true of neural networks as well. If you have way too many neurons in a not very complex you know, feature space, then the neurons will stop just learning the like general picture of the data and start learning like little statistical noise bits in the data. Even if the weights aren't large, this can happen if you have too many neurons because obviously they all add up to form the final output. So we know that different neural network architectures can learn the same data in different ways. And what we're going to talk about next is a technique that essentially leverages this fact to regularize a model, I, um, in essence, prevent overfitting. So one common strategy that you'll see in the real world is called ensembling, which is basically you train multiple models, each one with a slightly different architecture, and then you have them vote on the resulting like output. So if one model produces a certain output, and another, and, like you have two others that produce better outputs, then obviously the two that produce the correct answer will win out. And in general, and uh, in general, you can see, uh, mathematically show that ensembling, when the errors are, when the models themselves are like independent, you can show that ensembling has better accuracy than each model independently. So this is an ensemble classifier, but there's a problem with this. The problem is that training multiple models for a uh, give for like one really basic task is really time consuming and computationally expensive. And typically we don't actually want to do that. So what we need to do instead is train multiple models, but within a single architecture. So you don't waste time, you don't waste three times the amount of time trying to train three different models for a given feature space. So the solution to that is dropout, which basically means on each iteration, you pick some like sample of neurons and you quite literally drop them out of the neural network, which basically means you force them to, you, you force their weights to be turned off. And the result of that is you are simulating a different architecture of the neural network. Like um, each of these have a different architecture. This one is as if there's two neurons in the first hidden layer. This one is as if there's three. You can see the difference between them. And the general idea is if we do that, we're basically approximating the effects of ensembling, but we don't have to train, train three different models because we just train the same model with the, um, with the dropout parameter. If you increase your dropout probability, it's a hyperparameter so you can tune it, the um, model tends to resist overfitting better, but then the model as a whole becomes less complex because on any given iteration, more of your neurons will be turned off. And this could lead to underfit. So you have to tune the parameter to see what works best. And of course, like with ensembling, dropout does increase training time by a little bit because there's the additional effects of actually having to like encode different um, neurons being on and off. But in the grand scheme of things, it's faster than ensembling, and its addition tends to provide more benefits, assuming your parameters are trained or tuned correctly. Okay, um, so now we're going to, or I guess, is, is there any questions before on regularization or dropout, and how that works? Yes? So I'm still kind of confused, like, how the dropout actually speeds up the process. Is this going to still, like, iterate through? So it, sorry, it, it doesn't speed anything up. Basically what it's doing is it's just preventing overfitting as well. Oh, okay. um, yeah, yeah, so it, it actually does increase training time, right? Because you're going to need to train it more because, you know, there's going to be neurons that won't be trained on certain iterations. Um, and basically it's just kind of forcing the model to, like, 
you, it can't like rely on one like neuron that say will always like identify, I don't know, there's like a face right here, and I know that if there's a face right there from the data, that usually means that, I don't know, it's a, you know, it's a crossing guard or something, right? Because all the crossing guards have their faces in the upper left, right? It'll, it's kind of, it's kind of doing that sort of thing. Very handy. Does that make sense? The speed, the speed boost that um, we mentioned earlier is respect, with respect to ensembling, which is like when you train different models, it takes three times, the, like multiple times the amount of time to train each individual model. But drop dropout accomplishes basically the same effect without having to do that for different models. So that's where the performance right. boost comes in. It's still slower than just training one model without dropout. That answers my question. That answers it. Solid. All right. Data augmentation. OK, so often we're going to need more. Uh, data than is actually required. Um, once we actually get our pocket racers track and start collecting data, we will probably see that we do not have enough data. Um, so we're going to have to uh, try and find a way to get more data. And <laughs> well, what if uh, instead you know, we just use the same image multiple times, like some very environmentally friendly people you may know from IEEE? Well, that's kind of what we're doing. Um, of course, we can't just use the exact same data because that would basically be meaningless. There's no new information that we're going to be adding. Um, but we can uh, like change our data uh, minimally so that will tr to try and uh, throw the network off of learning um, basically uh, irrelevant patterns that would happen if we were to just uh, re repeat uh, the same data or not repeat the data at all. Um, so. Basically, uh, for example, you're adding new. If you add a new data data point um, that is a little bit different, um, the network will have to learn to identify the same or come up with the same label based on the two images, even with the slight differences. Um, so basically, just some some examples are you know recoloring the image, rotating the image, shifting the image, scaling the image, and reasons why this could work is if say you only have a few pictures of a mouse, um, then it might learn, like I was saying before, a very specific like positional data, like um, all these pictures of mice, you know, I don't know, either they have like a lot of green in them because the mouse was the photo was taken of it on a lawn, or the, all the mice, right, are like, you know, gonna be gay big in the in the photo. And we don't want it to like say, okay, my, we don't want it to learn that mice are gonna always be like 20 by 20 pixels. We don't want it to learn that mice appear in green areas. So if we, you know, turn it, flip the colors around or something like that, maybe it'll instead start identifying ear shape. Or if we grow the mouse, it could start learning different features that we actually want it to learn. Um, and that's, I guess, basically what I said here. Anyway. Any questions again? Yes. So it's because you can't like slow the neural ne neural network to learn like certain patterns. It's like kind of unknown, like what it will pick up for the pattern. Right. Yeah. So we don't we don't know what it's going to be learning. It's going to be ideally learning whatever's best, right? And if there's not very much data, it can very easily learn very specific patterns in that data. Um, and so by uh, using data augmentation, we can try and break this up. Um, yes, so now we're going to talk about improving, improving uh, learning uh, rather than overfitting. Um, so, you know, there's often, you know, we'll either talk about techniques people use to make learning go faster or just uh, the way to, you know, get the, get the, uh, the loss even smaller um, that might not be possible with just vanilla gradient descent. Uh, so, we're going to talk uh, quickly about vanishing gradients. Um, so in deep learning, right, we've got a whole lot of layers, and the, they identify uh, very complex patterns and important features. The, the problem is that they are very deep. And from last lecture, we talked about backpropagation, right? We calculated the gradients recursively. So each gradient was calculated from the gradient of the layer previously. Um, and here we talked about the uh, 
the chain rule, right? Again, we, yeah, we're, we are recursively um, we're recursively calculating these gradients. Um, now, oh, that's, oh wait, I'm just gonna hit this. Down, you did the down arrow or something? I don't know. Oh, I hit the down arrow and the side arrow at the same time. Yeah. Okay, um, anyway, so the issue here is with the vanishing gradient problem, or is with the activation, and sometimes also the weights. But for now we're gonna talk about just about the activation. Um, and that is, if you're using sigmoid or tan h, um, the derivative of the activation function gets really, really small as you, have, as you get really high or really low values um, for your logits or your inputs to these, um, to these functions. So, um, if, say, you have a really high value coming out of one layer, right, as you backpropagate through that layer, the derivative is going to be really small. And then um, this, that dc, d, uh, dz of L minus 1 value is going to be really small. And it's going to be then used to calculate the next one and the next one. And all the gradients past that are just going to be really small and no learning is going to happen. Um, so this can happen either because of the... Um, that sigmoid function. It can also happen if the weights are too small. If, if on every gradient the weights are, the gradient of the weights is causing the, uh, this dc, dz term to get smaller and smaller, you will also get these vanishing gradients. Um, so that weight problem is generally solved either using batch normalization, which we'll talk about later, or uh, just initializing the weights to intelligent values. Um, the, this issue um, of the activation is actually the reason why we basically always use ReLU uh, as our activation. Um, it's basically been, been uh, empirically shown to work a lot better. Um, you will notice, of course, with ReLU that there is a very large section uh, of it where the gradient is zero. Um, this is usually not an issue in practice. Uh, it can be. Uh, and if it is, you can always use a leaky ReLU, which we talked about in the previous lecture. And basically that is just x over here, and then over here it's some alpha less uh, alpha times x where alpha is less than one. So this would just be like a really shallow slope. So this way some learning would still occur uh, when x is less than zero. All right, now we're gonna talk about batch normalization, which will help with many things. Indeed, batch normalization is cool. But anyway, so. You all have seen this before. This is a normal distribution, also known as a Gaussian distribution. It's like the, it's just the bell curve. And then this down here, you've seen that as well, probably. It's a z-score, which basically it's like uh, data, if you represent your data point in terms of the mean and the standard deviation of your set as a whole. And what that's doing is it's basically like normalizing the data by plotting it um, relative to all the other points in the data set, because you have to calculate your mean and standard deviation based on the other data points. So when you take a z when you take a z score, you can take two different distributions that are like from vastly different scales and you can compare them. So if one of your um, distributions is a range from like negative 1 to 1 and the other is 100 to 200, you can still compare them absolutely by converting them to z scores first. And this is really useful in a lot of contexts. In statistical analysis, it's very handy and as we're going to see, it is very important in machine learning as well. So, generally, when you take a large data set and train on it, you're not going to have a specific distribution that it always follows. Because, you know, your data set can be anything. Your different features themselves can be of different distributions. And in theory, they can be any value, and there's no real like, constraint on them. So, this means that the same weights in a model can produce vastly different results on different data points just because the features have different scales. So, like, if you think about a data set, like if you think about the health data that we gave you guys in lab four. For example, you might have had um, one column represent, representing the age of the data point, that's like any number from, I don't know, zero to 120 or something. And then you might have had another that's like their height, and, and that's like probably, um, if it's in centimeters, for example, that's like zero to 200. And as you, each feature has a different range, and this can prove problematic if you have the same weights, uh, if you have to use the same weights on different parts of the model. So each weight in a neural network is like a transformation on a certain feature in the data set. So if 
a feature has a certain distribution, like for example, the age being from zero to 100, the weight that it's, um, that's operating on that feature needs to learn that distribution. And these distributions can vary from feature to feature, and this can be a problem. Does anyone have any idea why? larger input has a greater data like a hole on the output of your system. Correct, actually. So let's let's take a smaller scale example. <laughs> you just cannot work well. Nah, you're chilling. You have, you have the um, right idea. So let's take a smaller scale example. If you have a um, 2D linear regression thing with like two weights, no bias. So it's basically your linear regression is going to be a plane. Um, you have this equation, um, the first weight times x1, the second weight times x2. It's easy enough. Um, you all have seen this in lecture four, I think it was. For this kind of a model, your loss curve is going to look like this, a parabola, with three dimensions, one being the first weight, one being the second, and the third being the loss. So when the inputs aren't normalized and the weights are meant to learn different distributions, they, the loss function might look like this. So this, con this is a contour graph, if you're not familiar with how to read it, basically the small gaps in between lines represent a really steep portion of the um, 3D plot. The larger gaps over here represent more shallow portions, and each sort of oval represents a point on the, um, on the, loss, on, like, the loss axis. So like all of these points in the innermost circle, they have the same value for L. So what we can see here is that if we make a small change to W2, it's gonna have a much greater impact on our loss than updates to W1. So like if we take, if we start like right here, and we move here, that increased our loss by a fair bit, but if we make that same change on the W1 axis, we didn't change our loss very much at all. This is more effectively visualized here. When we update our weights, we make small changes, but we don't know how each weight will actually affect our loss because we haven't really learned that yet. So what's happening here is the inputs to W2, their um, weight updates are kind of like overshadowing the weight updates to the first one, which means you kind of just bounce back and forth along the loss curve each time going from one steep end to the other and then back and forth. And we end up taking a long time to reach the minimum, even though the like, actual changes that we need to make are pretty obviously there. So, what we do instead is we take our data and we normalize it. We apply some mathematical transformations, such as the z-score, and we take it from something that looks like this to something that looks like this, where now both of these axes have pr a pretty similar range for the given data, and the result is the, con um, the contour graph for the loss function will look something like this. As you can see, it's more circular, which means that both um, updates to the set weight two and updates to weight one will have very similar effects on the loss value overall. Like now, when we do gradient descent steps, um, we make like small steps and we're actually progressing towards the minimum because they're not like just bouncing back and forth across the loss function. And when we do this, according to research in the real world, uh, it's been found that if you properly normalize your data, you can use higher learning rates because you have less risk of overshooting the minimum that's in the middle over here, and therefore will converge faster, and there's just a lot of reasons that make this good. So what we want to do is we want to normalize our data. Now the question is, how do we do that? Does anyone have any ideas? Well, you could scale every data point to shift the mean to zero and save your deviations for the next slide. That's correct. That is one option and we will now be discussing that option. So, as Jonathan said, how about we just normalize the data to um, some distribution? Well, you didn't say um, before we put it through the model, but we will suggest putting it through the model, or doing it before we put it through the model. And as I'm sure you guys have figured out by now, when we put something on a quote slide, it's usually not what we end up doing. So this was probably a quote from someone who writes articles about the new normal, but anyway, when we try that for a simple regression model, it might work because regression models, they only have one layer and you just put your, in, um, your inputs into the model, you put it, like, plug it into the equation and produce an output and that's it. And so that'll work for a regression model like that. But with a neural network, it's a different story because 
we're applying weight multiplications in layers where each time we apply some transformation, a, a non-linear transformation to the data, and then we pump it through the activation function. We, um, or rather, we apply a linear transformation, then we pump it through the activation function to make it non-linear. And then we do that for like multiple layers until we get to the end. This means that the network essentially has multiple points in the sort of neural network process in which the input distribution can change, even if we normalize it beforehand, because as we said earlier, you have to um, take your like, weight initial your initial weights in a um, kind of an intelligent way, and these initial weights will typically end up being random according to a certain distribution. But since they are random, you can change the um, you can change the results of each layer in a variety of ways just by influencing the initial weights. This is a process known as internal covariate shift. If you've ever taken a machine learning class, or if you take like ECEC 147, you'll learn about it. It's kind of cool. But this is, the basically, this is basically the problem that motivates batch normalization. So what we need to do in batch normalization is we normalize the inputs each time we multiply them by the weights. So before we, basically before, right before we put them through an activation function, we normalize them. And this has the effect that once we've like, multiplied them by our weights, which can affect the distribution by like, scaling it up or shifting it in some way, then we normalize it back down, and then we push it through the rest of the network. So, see what this looks like. Here's a bunch of variables that we're going to be referencing. Uh, basically, the main ones you need to know are, you guys have already seen mean and standard deviation, or mean and variance, it's just standard deviation squared. Uh, epsilon is like a very small non-zero value. It's not really that important, it just avoids division by zero errors. And then this is our data point that's normalized, the x with a little hat on top. And then this is going to be the output after batch normalization. normalization. It's the x with the squiggly line on top, the tilde. And then m is going to be our batch size. So to normalize a data point, first we convert it to its z-score. Um, you, I just explained how that works, but basically you calculate the mean as shown here. You calculate the variance. This is a um, formula you guys have probably seen. I'm not sure. If you've taken a stats class, you've probably seen it. And then this is the z-score formula. It looks slightly different because we have the variance here, so you have to square root to get the standard deviation. And we also add epsilon in, so that in case for some reason your variance is zero, this won't cause problems. But one okay. sorry. Sure. I just want to make very clear that this m is the batch size, and you are summing across the batch size. So you don't care about layers, you're going through the batch, you can run each element through the batch, and you look at the activation for that, for that, uh, for each element in the batch, and then you're doing that for one neuron, and the neuron is ignoring all the other neurons. It just cares about itself and the data. Okay. Thank you. Yes, um, I forgot to mention M is the batch size, and we do this for... I was just, I was just making sure. Okay. So anyway, we do this for uh, each mini batch in our, like, in our learning process. We don't do it for the entire data set. We just go batch by batch, and once we do this, converting it to its um, normalized value, x hat, then this is what we do at the very end. This is one final equation that looks kind of fancy. It's a little bit, um, it's a little bit scary with lots of Greek letters and no numbers. But anyway, basically what it's doing is it's going to take your normalized value, so the value that you've already converted down to a standard normal distribution with mean of, uh, mean of 0 and variance of 1. And once you do that, you basically scale and shift it according to these two um, parameters, gamma and beta. What this is doing is basically it's saying that you change your standard deviation, your variance from uh, one to whatever gamma is, and you change your mean from zero to whatever beta is. And what this is doing is basically um, we have these as parameters in our model. So like in the batch normalization layer, we have parameters that are now we can that now can be learned through gradient descent. Like they now factor into our loss at the end, and as a result, what we can do is in gradient descent, we can actually learn the optimal values that minimize our loss function. And the idea here is that different features will inevitably have different distributions, and we want that to be like preserved, and we want that to be something we can actually learn from. So the result is with this equation our neural network can now learn the different um, about, like, distributions of features and actually sort of use them to its advantage. 
So since the optimal solution will re probably require a different distribution than the unit normal distribution, we train these parameters and we, it can learn the final results. Uh, yeah, we're gonna cover questions first, John. Yeah. It's a good idea. Any questions? Excellent. Okay, I can talk about optimizers now. So I think you should give them a moment to read this. <laughs> anyway. Yes. Okay. Optimizers. So this is what we've been using so far. It's gradient descent. It's pretty good. We can make it better. Oh yeah. So the first thing we're going to talk about is momentum. You can add momentum to your gradient descent. Uh, and this solves sort of this problem of bouncing back and forth where basically, uh, yeah, you, you just have this um, in regular gradient descent, um, if you were to like say start here, you could bounce here and here. And as you can see down here, the gradients are very high um, and we're updating way more than we want to. Um, so what we can do here is we can average the gradient um, with previous gradients. And this is gonna basically just prevent it from doing these really sharp direction changes. And it's gonna act a little bit like if you think about a ball rolling down the hill, down a hill, it doesn't just like at every point um, go in the direction of the hill, it's got momentum from where it was rolling before. So, so um, do a little bit of math here. Um, momentum, we're gonna keep track of the running average of gradients, that's gonna be V. Um, we're gonna use alpha, and that's gonna basically just be how much we want to uh, remember uh, our previous average. Epsilon is going to be our learning rate, and G is whatever the current gradient is. Um, so what does uh, momentum look like in terms of equations? It's going to look like this. So we're going to take um, V, which is going to be, I guess, our, our velocity, uh, and we're going to uh, take our previous velocity, we're going to multiply it by alpha, which is going to be less than 1, and then we're going to subtract, because right, it's gradient descent, we subtract our gradients, uh, epsilon times our gradient from that, and put that into our velocity. And then we're going to update our weights with our velocity. Um, so basically what you can look at it is, this is, if we were going in this direction, this was our last step. Our next step is going to be in the same direction, scale down a little bit. Uh, and then our gradient, this is going to be our gradient step. This is what the, I don't know, what, I guess what the gradients look like here. Uh, and we're just going to sum these two. Uh, so as you can see, look, it's going a little bit more towards the center. Obviously this is kind of a BS example, but it gives you a bit of an idea um, of what this would look like. Um, do we understand momentum? Sweet. Um, okay, so momentum, you can often overshoot um, uh, since you know you're going towards your uh, going towards your minimum, um, unless like you've had a very very flat uh, gradient for like a really long time and your momentum is like very small, um, you're gonna just overshoot right past that. Uh, and there's also some other optimizations that can be done with momentum. So we're going to introduce this idea of Nesterov momentum. And the basic idea here is when you're taking a step, you know, we're, we're going to be taking a step uh, of, a, you know, of our momentum and our gradients, but we know we're going to be taking the momentum step. Um, so we can actually calculate our gradients after having taken our momentum step, um, and then use those gradients when we update our weights. So this makes a little bit more sense, I think, when you see the equation. Um, so here, this uh, j is our loss function. So we're taking the gradients of, of j with respect to theta of theta after we've already updated it with this um, uh, with our momentum step. Um, and so this is what this is basically what the initial momentum is going to look like. And here is a um, a little example um, where if we're somehow. Okay, and this, I mean, this, this looks a little bit weird. Imagine this is shifted down. Um, but anyway, so if, if, or I guess imagine this is looking like that. Um, so if our momentum is going this way, we're gonna first step here and then calculate our gradients here, going back, and then our momentum step is gonna look like that. Um, as you can see, obviously that diagram is a little messed up. Just pretend that the white arrow is angled in the same direction as the orange arrow, and we're good. Oh, I think I just accidentally removed the arrows from the previous one, which had the momentum going in that direction. Oh. Anyway, whatever. But um, yes, Nesterov momentum. Any questions? Solid. Anyone, anyone trying to start a Nesterov fan club with me? Anyway. 
Okay, at a, at a grad um, is basically just the idea that once you've moved in one direction, um, you need to move in that direction less. Uh, <laughs> it can be thought a little bit like the D in when you're doing PID tuning, um, where you know you take a step in one direction, you don't want to move in, in that direction as much. However, this one has more memory than, than PID. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're just going to be scaling the learning rate for each individual weight based on how much you've updated that weight previously. Um, again, this is going to look a lot nicer when you just look at the equations, uh, I think. And so here we have this term A, uh, and every time we're going to be accumulating A by the, uh, the Hessian of, or the, yes, no, not Hessian, the uh, Hadamard product of G with itself, so that's just going to be every term of the gradient squared. Uh, and we're going to sum that up, and we're basically just going to keep a running sum, so every Every time we take a step, A is going to increase, and if you took a step in one direction, A for that value, or for that weight, is going to increase more. And then we're going to scale our, uh, we're going to scale our outputs, uh, or our gradients, by that value. So if A is higher for one weight, we're going to update that weight by less. Um, and here you can kind of see what, what we're trying to do, where you know, we're trying to we'd go here, and we try and take another really big gradient step. but you know, we've already taken a giant step in this direction, so it's going to be a little bit less. Um, the one thing that you could add to this um, is that since we've taken a very large gradient step in this upward direction, but a little bit less in this sideways direction, our step might even be a little bit more to the side, like that. Um, and anyway, uh, one thing you might notice about eta grad is that A will only ever increase. So basically our steps are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. RMS prop uh, basically is just eta grad but you include this beta term, and this beta allows you to decrease A as time goes on, um, similar to how we were doing momentum. So you kind of have a little bit less memory and you're not like remembering steps you did way early on in training. Are there questions about RMS property? Sweet. We're gonna now put them together for the gold standard, which is atom. And atom is basically, yeah, you can just kind of notice that RMS prop and momentum, you can just use them both there's no reason not to. So that's what Adam does. Um, and this is basically what people use nowadays um, for, as their optimizer of choice for most applications. Um, you keep track of two moments, and when you declare an item optimizer, these are uh, your two main hyperparameters. Uh, and the moments basically are like B1 and B2, uh, or beta 1 and beta 2, where beta 1 is keeping track of, is being used to calculate your velocity and beta 2 is being used to calculate um, that A term for the RMS prop. Um, now, uh, in this here, you may notice that this is a B tilde and an A tilde, whereas those Bs and As are not. That's because Adam has one small, one more small wrinkle. Get it? Wrinkle? Adam? Anyway. Um, and that is that it is doing this little bias correction, where at the beginning of training, um, beginning of training where you're not going to have any memory of previous values of the velocity and of a. Uh, so basically we just scale up our, uh, our, our yeah, we just scale up our, um, our velocity and our, and our uh, a term um, so that we can like have larger um, updating steps, or I guess not larger per se, but um, so that we, to in increase the, um, the effect of more recent more recent updates to A and B, if that makes sense. Uh, anyway, and T is the training iteration, right? So as T goes on, um, this term and this term are going to go to zero, uh, and we're just going to be um, frame. What? Why is, why is there no A's being multiplied here? Um, there should be a V, V here and an A here. Correct. There should be. Yeah. This should be scaling, v, um, yeah. vector v and vector a. I'll add those later. Okay. <laughs> Oops. Um, but, yeah. So, anyway, if you pretend there's an a here, then, you know, t is, if t is only one, then we're going to be scaling up a because there's no previous values of a for it to have built up like memory. But then as we go on, this number goes to zero, this number goes to one, A tilde approaches whatever A is, and we start ignoring this term. Um, so if we put together all the equations, 
this is what you get plus some extra terms, which is Mr. Cotton. Anyway, yes? In the final expression, what does this D with like nothing about it mean? Oh, that's new. It's um, It plays a role similar to epsilon, I believe. Like from, okay. because so here, so epsilon is our learning, learning rate, right? so we can't use epsilon for like the little non-zero that avoids divide by zero errors. So we use new. We love machine learning notation. I just couldn't tell if it was a Greek letter or a weird font for a B. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, I don't think the Greeks could either. <laughs> anyway, there you are. <laughs> you know this guy knows Krav Maga, am I right? <laughs> okay. Anyway, any questions before we get into the last, uh, the last topic for the quarter? All right. So. Now we're going to talk about binarization. So, this is a neural network that we've been using in basically all of our diagrams for the last two months. It's very small, probably not going to learn very much. It's, um, yeah, you wouldn't see this in actual practice, but in order to infer an output from the inputs that you provide to this network, you perform 18 multiplications for every single weight in here. I counted. Uh, 14 additions for all the biases and other um, summation and whatnot, and then seven activation functions for each of these neurons. That's a lot of math, and when you grow your neural network to something with a lot more neurons, this is going to scale up like exponentially. It's not great. So what we need to do is find a way to do less math, because most of our devices are not capable of handling this, especially Raspberry Pis. And if you'll notice, the bulk of what we're doing here is the weight multiplications, which scale at a, um, very, in a, at a very large rate based on the number of neurons we add. Uh, assuming all of the values are like 32-bit floating point values, you have to do a floating point multiplication for every single connected neuron pair, which is a lot of CPU instructions, a lot of you know, time spent. And even if we do like various matrix oper operations, it's a lot. So what we need to do is we need to speed up model inference, aka like at least for when we're predicting things with a trained model, we need to speed it up with some sort of different operation. And some fancy schmancy researchers have found a trick called binarization, which is basically the idea that if you convert every single neuron in a network to basically a one-bit value, like its weights are all one-bit, the um, biases are one-bit, whatnot, we can basically do 32 operations in a single bitwise instruction. Like you just pack all of those bits together and suddenly you have a much faster way of actually doing math in a neural network. So the question now is, how do we binarize a neuron or weight? Any ideas? Chilling. So, there are three pieces to the binarization puzzle, which is basically, first we have to figure out how to binarize weights, we have to figure out how to binarize the activation function, and we have to figure out how to binarize multiplication. Because we have to do all of these things to actually infer from a trained model. So research has found that if you want to reduce a 32-bit number to just one bit and, produce, and preserve as much useful information as possible, the best technique is to just consider the sign of that bit. So you basically encode the weight as either zero or one, where one is just one and zero is negative one, and um, this basically determines whether your weight is positive or negative, and in, it's now a one-bit number. This is the sign function. It's pretty self-explanatory. Positive values are one, negative values are negative one, zero is zero. For this to be a meaningful optimization, our weights also have to be negative one or one. So what we do is we apply the sign function to the weights to extract a one bit number, to either extract either negative one or one from whatever like massive 32 bit floating point number we already have. And then we encode it as a one bit number using by just assigning zero to be negative one and one to be uh, zero and up. So the last step here is we need to improve the uh, actual process of multiplying. So if we have a one-bit number, and um, as I said, we use the encoding from before, we know that this is all true. We have these four basic identities of multiplying one and negative one. 
So if you represent them as bits, the mapping looks like this. And there is a single digital logic um, operation that, like a, a, base, a single bitwise operation that takes, that basically produces this truth table. Uh, does anyone have any idea what it's called? Um, Correct. This is the equivalence operation, also known as an XNOR, where basically we take two bits and return whether or not they're equal. So if you if previously you had 32 weights to multiply by your inputs and produce, the, and that would have taken 32 CPU instructions, now you can do it in most CPUs with just one or two if you like pack them into a single number and then do this. So this is a massive improvement, and on low power devices like IoT, Arduinos, um, um, Raspberry Pis, things like that, this is going to be very, very useful. So, of course, we are making a trade-off here, and that's when we binarize our values, we lose a significant amount of accuracy. Because obviously, a one-bit number can't represent all the finer details of the 32-bit uh, floating point that has a large range from negative infinity to infinity. But, and therefore, our binarized weights won't be as precise. However, research shows that with a well-trained network that's very good at generalizing in its original state, even after you binarize, it's not a significant difference. You can you lose a little bit of accuracy, but it's not that much. And the upside, of course, is that your network is now so much faster. So quickly to summarize, when you have an unbinarized neural network, you have all your really um, large weights and neurons, and you can use any activation functions. And what you the downside, of course, is that it's slower with one operation per machine instruction, and you don't lose any and but you don't lose any accuracy. However, with binarized neural networks, we make everything a ton smaller. We can only use the sign function as our activation because that's basically how we introduce non-linearity non into our multiplication results. And we um, we can now do that should say more than one operation per machine instruction, and then we lose a little bit of accuracy, but it's fine. So. In the large, in large scale, like servers or like a giant task where you have a large computing cluster, you probably wouldn't be binarizing because you have access to a lot more compute power. But for us, we're probably going to be going with binarized neural networks because our Raspberry Pis are weak and sad. Also, I um, feel the need to mention when you're training your neural network, you don't like do anything with your weights. You train the neural network on a fancier device than a Raspberry Pi, and your weights will all be trained with like actual gradient descent on real like floating point values. The binarization part happens after your model is trained, when you basically need to infer outputs from it. Any questions on that? So binarization is modifying a trained neural network to make the predictions more computationally easy? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Anything else? Cool. And that's it. Thank you guys for listening. I know there are any questions, any last thoughts, comments, concerns, jokes. Excellent. All right. Thank you guys for coming. Yes.